All right, welcome back to the second half of chapter three. We're going to start with 3.3 in this thing called the unit circle. And of course, we're going to add on to these functions by calling them, therefore, circular functions now, not just trigonometric. So dealing with a circle, which we've talked about, if we started at the origin and looked in the positive x direction, and we said that we'd rotate up. And if we kept going up and around, we would create that circle. Well, if we got to choose the size of that circle, we said the easiest one would be a radius of one, which means if we went out to the right, this would be the point one zero. And if we kept rotating up 90 degrees or what we now call pi over two, that would be the point zero one, negative one zero, zero negative one and 360 degrees or two pi would take us back to our original starting place. Now, of course, those are the four, what we call quadrantal angles, technically five, if we go all the way around, we got zero and the 360 or zero radians and two pi or 180 degrees here and pi. Well, then what about all the values in between? We're going to talk about those as well. And if you remember the way that we defined a radian last week was, well, from here to there, that was called a radius by definition, which means this is also a radius. And we defined this opening, this angle theta, as this arc length we called S, and if they were equivalent, then we knew that we could call that thing R, and that would be equivalent to one radian. So the way that we're going to define these things now is, well, what is sine always? What is it always equivalent to? The what over the what? Y over X, oh, R. Good, good, good. Y <laughs> over R, how about cosine? What's that one? Uh, X over Y, R. Good, that's the yeah. X over the R, and how about tangent? This one was Y over X. Excellent, very good. And of course, we got the other three reciprocal functions, cosecant, which would be the flip of that, secant, the flip of that and cotangent, the reciprocal or flip of that. Now we're just focusing on the big three because look what happens when we're on what is called the unit circle. And again, why do they call it the unit circle? Because it has a radius or size of one unit, whether it be feet, meters, centimeters, yards, miles, the unit a size of one. What's going to happen to sine, cosine, or tangent when we let r equal one? Well, if this becomes a one, notice what can we write sine as or cosine as? Now, tangent doesn't really change, right? But when we are on the unit circle, our radius becomes one, which means we can now write sine as just the y value and cosine as just the x value. And remember, when we picked any point on our circle, we always refer to the number line, the x-axis, the original thing that we learned, counting as a kindergartner, and we dropped wherever that point was to that. Even though we rotated to get to that angle all the way there, some angle theta, we said to get to that point, we're going to drop this perpendicular so that we form to the x-axis a right triangle. And we're going to use this angle inside. We called the reference angle in order to create our right triangle 
and use all of our right triangle trig, the Pythagorean theorem, all the things that we've learned thus far. Well, if I wanted to get to that point, any point, again, different quadrants, going to yield a different positive or negative. The values will still be the same. Because notice how far right I go and how far up I go there would be the same here and here. That x and that y. The only difference is this would be a negative x compared to a positive x. Notice the heights would be the same. But when evaluating these sines and cosines, if I can just write this as a y and this as an x, then most points are written as x comma y, aren't they? Well, then that means if we're on this unit circle where our radius is 1, then we can write our x as cosine and our y as sine. That ordered pair would be equivalent to writing it in terms of what are called these circular functions now. And if we know that this angle, this opening here, is equivalent to the arc length here, because remember, arc length was equal to r times theta. And again, if we're on the unit circle and this becomes a 1, then we know that these are equivalent. So whether I write it with the angle theta or now s, because they're equivalent, it shouldn't matter. Okay, If they write it with an s, that's going to mean usually that we're in, since it's an arc length, they're going to be using radians, where if it's theta, then it's usually going to mean that we're in degrees. Okay, but these are some of the little changes from section 3.1 to 3.3. We already saw some differences in 3.2. And oh, by the way, this is the equation that gives us the unit circle. And hopefully you guys remember this. We went over it a while back, and we divided everything by r squared to get r1. And then we wrote that as our cosine squared plus sine squared, the Pythagorean that we dealt with. So I don't like the unit circle in the fact that some teachers will have you memorize this whole thing where you find the x and the y for each of these? Because we already know the radius is the length of what? One. Yeah. To get here, we know the radius. We went right one and up none. So it's a radius of one. Here, we went up one and left and right none. So again, the radius is one on all of these. That's why it's called the unit circle again. But what if I went 30 degrees? of rotation to get here. Since my r is 1, I'd only need to know my x and my y. And don't you already know what the cosine of 30 is or the sine of 30? Yeah, yeah what's the sine of 30? It's 1 over 2. Good. It's 1 half. What's the cosine of 30? Uh, root 3 over 2. Excellent. And if you know those, then you also know the sine of 60. Because remember, cosine is the complement to sine. Which means this is also root 3 over 2. And again, since you know the sine of 30, you know the cosine of 60 is also what? 2 over 1. It's not the reciprocal. It's the co-function, the complement of sine. And if their angles are complements, meaning they add up to be 90 degrees, then you know they have the same ratio. Complement to sine. 
So again, if we know that we are on the unit circle, we have a radius of one, then we can forget about the r's because they're just ones. And we know that sine is equivalent to y and cosine is equivalent to x. So if you look at these values and I was to drop this perpendicular to create my right triangle, how far over and how far up? Because I already know that this is a one for a 30 degree angle. Well, don't you already know the cosine of 30? What is it? Root three over two. Then that's my x. Because we said that cosine is equivalent to x. And don't you already know the sine of 30? Yep. What's the sine of 30? One half. then I know that's my y because we know that the unit circle provides the r already. We're just going to have to come up with the x and the y, which is your cosine and sine now. Does that make sense? A little. So we're looking at a 30 degree rotation or remember in our new chapter three, pi over six radians, then if you know the cosine of 30, then that's your x value. And if you know the sine of 30, then that's your y value. Let's go to 45. Do you know the sine and cosine of 45? Yeah. What is it? Uh, cosine is root two over two. And what sign? Uh, the same thing. Very good. <laughs> Just like these were as well. Which means if you know the cosine of 45, then you know the X value because we're on the unit circle. So it's just the X. And if you know the sign of that, Again, it's just the Y because it's also a one for R. So how far over and how far up to get to that point? With a rotation of 45 or pi over four radians? It'd be over exactly root two over two and up exactly root two over two. If you don't believe me, use the Pythagorean theorem, square this, square this, add them together, and you would get one. Because we know the radius of this is already a one. How about our 60 degrees or pi over three? How far over? What is that gonna depend on? What trig function? Oh, I'm sorry. Cos. Cosine is our x. And do you know the cosine of 60 degrees? Um, okay. Very good. So that means we would have to go over one. Does this look like half of one? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. That's because it is. Now, how far up did we go? In the y direction. Well, what does y depend on? What trig function? Sine. Very good. Usually it's y over r, but because we're on the unit circle, the r became a 1, so we could just focus on the y. And do you know for 60 degrees or pi over 3 what the sine of 60 is? Square root of 3 over 2. Then we know our y value. So this is why I don't like the unit circle. You have to memorize all of those. Well, we already have them memorized. All you need to know is that you can apply it to this and do the same thing. 
Now, again, notice my Y value. When I go 30 degrees, what do we say the sine of 30 was? Sorry. Okay. Now, notice, doesn't that look like halfway to one? Yes. So, again, all of these values, we're looking at how far over and up. How far over and up over and up to get to each one of those points based on the rotation that we would be going. And if we're on any one of the quadrantal angles, do we have to do any thinking? Do we have no. to have any of this memorized? No. Because we know the X and the Y based off of the unit circle. And again, we know the R for each one of these is a one. So here's the cool thing, guys. Notice that the heights of these are what? How high up is this one? It's a length of one half. How high up is this point? Or this point? Or this point is all the way up one, right? Each yeah. one of these, we can see the height based off of the Y value. Well, notice what is this height compared to this height? They're the same. How about this height and this height? What are they? Yeah. They're the same. same huh? Yeah. How about this and this? Same. Now, why? Well, remember, this value right here, even though I'd have to rotate 150 degrees to get there, remember, we would drop that to the x-axis to create our right triangle. And if we went 150 degrees or five pi over six radians, what reference angle would we have here? <sighs> How much did we come back from the 180 degrees to only go 150? Oh, 30. Very good. And don't we already know both values for 30? Don't oh. we know the cosine and the sine of 30? Yeah. So notice this triangle and this triangle are the exact same. The only difference, this would have a positive X and a positive Y, where this would have a what? A negative X. And a positive, mm -hmm. positive y. y. Very good. Which means everything in this quadrant would have a negative X and a positive Y, wouldn't it? Yes. But would the value of this point and this point be any different? No. Because it's still going to be a 30 degree reference. And if this is 90, then we know that these are the 30, 60, 90 values. So don't you already know all of these points since you know all of these points? This is still going to be a root d over two and a one half. This is still going to be a root two over two and a root two over two. This is going to be a one half and a root three over two. The only difference is going to be the signs. And we know that the x values our cosines and the sines are going to be the y values. And since everything up here is positive for my y values,
and everything down here are going to be what? For my y values. Negative. I know that I can put negative, negative, negative for all my y values. And same thing with the x's. I know if this is my x and my y axis, we know that the y axis separates the positive x's. Positive, positive, positive. These will all be positive x's. But to the left here, these are all going to be what kind of x's? Negative. Very good. And notice cosine is positive. To the right, negative. To the left. All we got to be able to do is know the reference angles for each of these. And remember, do we prefer the degree measurements or do we prefer the radian measurements for reference angles? I agree with that question answer. Radians? Because I know that this is 30. I know that this is 45. And pi over 3 is 60. Then when I see a pi over 3, whether it's 2 pi over 3s, 4 pi over 3s, or 5 pi over 3s, I know that those are all what kind of reference angles? Sixties, and I already know the sine and cosine of all of the sixties. So whether it's two pi over three, one pi over three, four pi over three, or five pi over three, what do I know? I know my x and my y are all going to be the same values. The only difference will be whether they're positive or negative. So again, if you have these memorized, don't need to memorize this. I much prefer reference angles than the unit circle, but notice what 3.3 .3 is titled. I wanted to at least go over it and show you why we're gonna look at these things a little bit differently. And whether they put sine of theta or S, we know that those are equivalent because S is equal to R times theta. And if R is a one, then we know that S is equal to theta. And therefore we can call these S's as well. That just means we're on this unit circle typically rather than other radiuses or lengths. Okay, so again, help me out. How would we fill this or the rest of this out? Pretty simple. Look at the reference angles right here. What do we know that is a reference angle of? What's pi over six equivalent to? And 30. Then do you know the X value, which is the cosine of 30? What's the cosine of 30? Uh, square root of 3 over 2. And what's the Y value or the sine of 30? Oh, half. And it shouldn't be O oh, half. I see it. You should have that one memorized by now. Okay. How about pi over 4? What is it equivalent to in degrees? 45. And do you know the cosine of 45? And do you know the sine of 45? Yeah. Then you write them down. Just notice the sine and cosine in quadrant three, which would actually be five pi over fours, or 225 degrees of rotation, would put us in quadrant three, which means they are both my X and my Y 
negative, negative to get there. Or the cosine and sine are negative. How about pi over three? What's that? Um, 60. And do you know the cosine of 60? Yeah. And do you know the sine of 60? Half? Maybe. Or square root of three over two. I just forgot the word square root. Yeah, you're good. And again, notice that these flip flop order because of the 30 and 60 and the fact that they are complements to one another. They add up to be 90. Now, so are 45 and 45, but they are the exact same value. Okay, so what about for the 60 here, the 45 here and the 30 there? They're all going to be the same values. The only difference is some are positive, some are negative, depending on what quadrant we're in. So for my 60, I know I'm going to have the 1 half and root 3 over 2 for cosine and sine. 45 is the easiest because they're the exact same. And that 30 degree reference angle, cosine of 30, sine of 30. There, my friends, is your unit circle. And what did you really need to know? Out of all of that, the 30, the 45, and the 60 reference angles. Because if you know those three, then you will get the same here, there, and there as far as our values go. The only thing that changes is whether it's positive or negative. But we have this to help us with that. So again, I wanted to show you this, but it's not necessary. This, I think, is much easier to memorize than this whole thing. But some people really like it because then they have everything already listed for every single angle that we know the exact values of. All right, so that's basically it for this section. The only thing I wanted to make sure that I add on is what we talk about, the domain. This is going to lead us into our next, not 3.4, but chapter 4 that we meet next time for. Okay, we're going to start graphing these things, but we'll get there. Do you guys remember domain and range? Little. Yeah, a little bit. So domain was all the input values. The range was all the output values. And in trig, what does that mean? Well, what do we input? Angles. What comes out when I give you the angle for a specific trig function? Some ratio. So when they're talking about the domain, they're saying, well, what can we plug in? Right? What can we input? That's an angle that will give us some output or ratio. And you guys know for sine and cosine, there's just about anything. Because what can we input? Well, because we know we get y over r and x over r, and r can never be zero, then it doesn't matter what you put in, you'll get something out. Because like we said, sine on the unit circle and cosine on the unit circle just gives us out the x and the y value. Because r can never be zero. Why can r never be zero? Then we don't have a circle. We, we just have a point if it's zero. And you can't make an angle out of a point. 
have to have some radius length, whether it's that long, that long, or one, or even bigger. Then we can rotate around. Okay. So that means for sine and cosine, from negative infinity to positive infinity, anything you want to put in, you will get something out. But for all the other trig functions, we have issues. And when do we have issues with fractions? When we have a zero in the denominator. So you can see the pairings of these are a little bit weird, right? Sine and cosine makes sense. They're complementary functions. Sine, cosine. They kind of go hand in hand in a way that we talked about already. But look at the other pairings. Tangent and secant, and then cotangent and cosecant. You would think tangent and cotangent would go together. And secant and co. But again, we're not talking about the co-functions. We're just looking at their ratios. And you know tangent is always the y over the x. And therefore, cotangent, the reciprocal, x over y. Secant is the reciprocal of cosine. So that's the r over x. And cosecant is the reciprocal to sine, which is r over y then. And that's why we pair these up together, because look at their denominators. And we know that we cannot have that denominator equal to zero if we want to get something out. Because as we mentioned before in the warm up, what happens when we divide by a zero? It's undefined. So we're saying, well, this, that's no good. We can't put that into cotangent and get something out. So that's not part of our domain. That's not part of the stuff that we could put into it and get something out. So we're not really, even though we're telling them what we can put in for the domain, which for sine and cosine is everything, what we're really looking for is what can't we put in? So again, instead of theta, they're going to use S because that's the new part of this section, right? Because we said S is equal to theta if R is a 1. So whether they put theta or S just means we're on our unit circle typically. So our angle S cannot equal an odd pi over 2 for tangent and secant. Now, again, why? Let's go back to what is pi over two. Well, where is X equal to zero on our unit circle? The only times we're going to have zeros is when we're on one of our four what? You guys see that? Yeah. The only time we're going to have a zero involved in the X's and Y's is when we're on one of our four quadrants. So either this point, this point, this point, or this point. That's the only place that we have zeros. Those two for the Y, these two for the X. So notice, guys, when we're looking at tangent and secant and their ratios that they always give we're focusing on the denominator and because the r can never be a zero then we know <clears throat> we can plug in anything but here we have x's and here we have y's and we know there are not many but a few four actually to be exact places where either the x or the y can equal zero and where is x zero? Well, if x is zero, that means we didn't go right or left any. So that means we only went up or down. And remember, that is our 90 degrees or 180 divided by 2. 
That's our pi over two. And if this is one pi over two, remember this is two pi over twos, and therefore this was three pi over twos. That's the other place where x would be equal to zero. So what trig functions have the x in the denominator? That was the tangent, which was y over x, and secant, which was r over x. And how would we ensure, no matter what number you chose, that you got an odd number? Pick a number, any number. How can I make sure that whatever you choose would yield an odd coming out? I make it even by doubling it. So whether you picked a four or you picked a five, if I doubled it, I'd get eight, right? And if I doubled five, I'd get 10. Because by definition, an even number is something that is divisible by two. So if I just put a two in it, no matter what number you chose, it's now even. But remember, we wanted the odd pi over twos, the one pi over two, or three pi over two, or if we kept going around, five pi over two, seven pi over two, or even negatively, negative pi over two, negative three pi over two, had to be odd to get that x of zero. Well then, double it and add one. Because we know that if you get an even number, to get an odd, you'd have to either add or subtract one. And it's just easier to add one. So that's what we did. So to get my odd pi over two, that's the way that they write it. And what are we saying? The domain is all the angles or things that we could put in that gives us something out. Sine and cosine, anything? Tangent and secant, what are the only things that work? Well, again, pretty much everything, but no odd pi over twos. So we're saying our angle, theta, which is S, can be anything but odd pi over twos. And lastly, how about cotangent and cosecant? Well, we know those functions always, cotangent is the reciprocal of tangent, so x over y, and cosecant is the reciprocal of sine, so r over y. And notice in the denominator, we know we can't have a y equal to zero if we want it to give us something out. So where is y equal to zero? Well, that means we're not up or down any. So that means we're either right or left some. And you know that to get there, it's 180 degrees or what we now call pi. And this would be double that to pi. Or go around again. 3 pi, 4 pi, 5 pi, 6 pi. Or again, you can go negatively. Negative pi, negative 2 pi, 3 pi, any pi. So that's what we mean by this one. Our angle, theta, or s can be anything. That straight bar means given that our angle s is not some pi because then we know that we are on the x-axis, which our y would be zero, which would yield something that's undefined. So not a huge deal right now that you understand that, but it is something that is going to come into play next time we meet when we get into chapter four and graphing these things. Okay, so that's just a little segue intro, starting out the thought process for some of these things, more so for chapter four. Okay, that's it for that section. Not a whole lot that's new. The only thing I wanted to show you is we're now using our reference angles to come up with ordered pairs 
on what is called the unit circle because we now know when our r is a one, it leaves us with cosine as our x and sine as our y. So we can write that ordered pair instead of x comma y as cosine of an angle comma sine of that angle. All right, that's it for that section. Again, continue to memorize the new reference angles in rating measurement, pi over six, pi over four, and pi over three. And all the big three trig function ratios for each. All right, last section of chapter three. I know that seems quick and it is. Uh, make sure you're staying on top of the work um, not just doing it to get it done, but really understand and comprehend, which is a great segue into what I'm going to go over now. And the last section of uh, most of these chapters are application based. So here's another application of the radian measurements that we've been talking about and introduced at the beginning of this chapter, chapter three, linear and angular speed. So what I'm going to start by doing is defining what speed means. And we know how to find the distance if we knew the rate or speed that we were traveling and for how long. But if we wanted to know the rate that we were traveling and say we went down to LA to watch the Super Bowl and we knew how much time it took, then we could find on average actually our rate by simply just dividing by T. And in doing that, we then found our rate would be equal to the distance over the time. So if we're talking about a linear and angular speed, again, we live on a sphere. If we flatten that earth, that sphere, then it looks two dimensional. It looks like a circle. And if we're going to talk about the rate of speed, okay, we call it angular speed, then what do you think we're going to measure distance by? Well, the distance in the angular speed is going to be measured by the distance around we rotate, also called the angle. So the angular speed, we're going to use this weird Greek letter. It looks like a W in ours, but it's actually omega and no big deal. I just call it W because it looks like one. It's easier that way. We're going to say that our distance is some angle, theta. And of course, time is always the same no matter where you're at. It's just a, dependent on seconds, minutes, hours, days, years, months, whatever. So time is the one constant of measurement throughout. So that will always be the T. Again, it's just a matter of how fast are we talking? Like we talked about at the very beginning of this class when I gave you guys that tough question about how long does it take for a pitcher to throw that ball across home plate? And we talked about it being in miles per hour and that doesn't really make a lot of sense so we got it down to feet per second which made more sense okay that's it that's how very simple we defined angular speed it's just by taking our distance formula rate times time and solving for the rate or speed which is just distance over time and if we're measuring the speed in angles then we're going to be looking at how fast this rotates in a certain amount of time but this is the one that's a little tricky what if we were to deal with what is called linear speed if we're on a line now again if we were to travel from here to la believe it or not guys that's not a straight line and i'm not just meaning by the different roads and yeah when you're up in the foothills or the uh, grapevine 
I mean, if we were to travel from Fresburg all the way to LA, we actually are on a sphere. We're on a circle, which means that straight line, that line, because of how big Earth is, if you look out on the horizon, which is why people thought when you looked out at sea that there was an end to the earth and you were going to fall off it like a waterfall. We actually travel on a curve, on an arc. And so our distance that we're going to be traveling when we're thinking about from a point to another point on a sphere, or in this case, two-dimensional circle, you're actually traveling on an arc. And so that distance that you're traveling, which seems like a line, is actually an arc. And that, therefore, is what we are going to put and measure our distance on the outside of the circle instead of the inside of the circle, which is angular speed. Does that make sense a little bit there? Yeah. So our distance on the outside of a circle is measured by that arc length, S. So that is one, unfortunately. There is more than one. But that is one of the ways that we can find our linear speed or rate. Okay? So angular speed, they use a symbol that has curvature, angles. That omega, okay, that W-looking shape. Linear speed, we're going to use one that doesn't. It's like a V, okay, for velocity. You can think of that. So linear speed, they're going to use the V. Angular speed, the omega. And we know that it's S over T. But do you guys remember what S was equal to? We went over that last time just a little bit. I reviewed it. But in 3.2, we defined it. What was theta. S representing? What, what did it equal? Theta. Close. That was only on the unit circle. It was theta. But very good, Jacob. What is it always? The radius. S represented our arc length. And very good. It needed, if we wanted to know the length of an arc, it depended on how big the circle was and what angle you rotated. The smaller the circle, the smaller the arc's going to be, even if the angle's the same, right? The bigger the circle, then the bigger that arc length's going to be, even if the angle's the same. So the arc length is dependent on two things, the size of the circle and the size of the angle. Just for a quick review, because since we are using that S as the length on a circle, we call it the linear speed or rotation that we're looking at. Then since we know S is equal to R theta, we could also write our V as this, but that's kind of ugly. And didn't we just define that theta over T is equal to W or Omega? Do you guys see the theta over T? Mm -hmm. Well, then rather than having that ratio, since it's equivalent to that Omega, that W, I could just rewrite this as what? as the W that we know it's equivalent to. So you actually have two variations of how to find that linear speed. Again, linear on a circle.
okay? So when are you gonna know when to use what? Well, if they say linear speed, you're gonna use that V, but it depends on what they give you on which one of these you're going to use. Again, you can even use this one. When are you gonna use the angular speed? Well, the good news is you only have one option. When they talk about angular speed, that's this, which means they need to give us theta and t. But remember guys, in math, we need to have one equation with just one unknown. And does it always mean that they're going to give you the two things and ask you for the one that's already solved? Unfortunately not. They could ask us for the angle and tell us these two pieces, which means all you'd have to do is what? Multiply over by T to get your angle by itself. And then multiply and simplify those to get your angle. All right. So uh, believe it or not, that is it, my friends. There's those formulas again in a nutshell. A little bit cleaner for you. But I wanted to derive them for you so that you could see why they are what they are and where they came from. But that is it, not only for the last section, 3.4, but for this chapter, which means we got to finish this homework, do the group quiz to make sure that we got all this down, and then you guys can start your individual quiz to kind of assess whether or not you mastered all the material for chapter three. Okay, now remember, you have some time to do that, and you have multiple attempts to improve on that score if you want. So make sure that you get the homework and the group quiz done because those are due Sunday by midnight. Okay, the individual quizzes won't be due until right before the exam that we take in a couple weeks. All right, that's it. Make sure that you guys work together, either meeting up with our TA or going over it with each other. Don't forget you can post on the discussion board. Do these, practice them, make sure that you master them. I'm around to help if you need me. I got office hours. You can reach out via the discussion board. I prefer that over messaging me via email or Canvas because if you have that question, most likely somebody else would benefit from seeing it too. All right, good luck. Wish you guys the best. On wrapping up chapter three, we'll start chapter four next time. Until then, Alan out.